guys, we have a story today of an all wizard party. And it's just an example of how OP wizards can be when used right. So remember to subscribe, like and comment and I'll see you at the end of the video. Okay, so in a mage game, I was the DM. The party consisted of the following. Shadow names in quotes. Al O.T. Alan Mitwicker. Almost purely a life mage. By the end, probably the most powerful in an individual field. Reached Archmage in it. Basically the party leader, partially responsible for what happened. Valerie Soul. Beverly Johnson. Party Heart. Kept most of the people together and mediated fights. Split her studies between death, matter and prime. And while not quite as powerful as most of the others in individual fields, made up for it by bending said focuses together. Dr. Frost. Michelle Turning. Prime Forces. Probably the dullest party member as far as role playing was concerned. But still did pretty well. Character spent time working in pharmaceutical, which, when you're magic, made obtaining stuff that the party normally wouldn't have a bit easier. Basically, the muscle of the group. Necked Nick. Danny Moran. The crazy, who managed to, despite using vulgar magic like motherfucker, almost never paradoxed. Mostly focused on time, but did a couple of other things as well. Was honestly probably the most powerful person in the party, if only because she kept finding slash doing awesome things for the plot and such. But due to the spread, wasn't as powerful in each individual field as most of the other specialists in the party. It all started during a street fight against a couple of low-level schmuck vampires. The party paradoxed quite a bit, but none of them bothered trying to see if this was because someone mundane had been seeing the magic they had all been throwing about. Long story short, someone was. Well, problems started slowly arising for the party over the course of multiple sessions. They found that they were being tailed by people. Strange folks would lurk around their domiciles, and normal, non-insidious seeming people were distancing themselves from the party. Rumours of the party being a bunch of weird wannabe anarchists slash Wiccans were circulated by normal folk. But it was just that. Rumours. Basically, they were ostracised, but nothing overt. The party was basically used to it. After all, the party, over the course of about six to seven sessions, had pretty much made a name for themselves as folk who would banish terrible things from whence they came. Alan advertised himself as a gardener, which gave him the convenient excuse to have a shit ton of plants around. Beverly ended up working in jewellery. Michelle kept the pharmacy spiel going. And Danny? Danny banished poltergeists and advertised herself as a wizard for hire. The party, due to outside pressures, actually moved their characters under a single roof, if only for protection. For a while, all was well. The game effectively developed into a sitcom for a few sessions, and the party members got to bond a bit without their lives being at constant risk. When they had mage work that had to be done, they would try and usually succeed in getting rid of folk who were tailing them. The only people who consistently failed were Alan and Danny, and when it caused the former a number of problems with Paradox, it wasn't anything that was going to kill him. More than likely not. Meanwhile, I'm rolling in the background like a motherfucker because a few times the followers managed to tail the party member. They try to bring a recording device. Each time, it adds a greater and greater pull, where once it was only a couple of guys in trench coats, more and more shitty people were getting interested in this party. Of course, the jokes end when someone burns down Alan's bonsai tree garden. Finally, the party becomes interested in who slash why the fuck they're being followed and start looking for some answers. So some background. Long story short, the original person who saw a party member cast some magic had started most of the rumours that had plagued the party. This hadn't been much of an issue, but this had, for whatever reason, tweaked the interest of a local group of gangsters. And when more and more evidence of the party's capacity to do some funky shit arose, this got this street gang more and more intrigued. Originally, that wouldn't have been much of an issue. But when some of them went looking around for cult volumes slash texts, one of them had the grave misfortune of finding a legit tomb of devil summoning. Just from touching the tomb, the guy had gotten his mind basically hijacked by a lesser demon and essentially walked the body and book back to the gang hideout to display what new power had been found in this book. This small group of gang members start to grow as they start demonstrating God's damned miracles and instilling a loyal and terrified following to work as soldiers. These people are formed of the homeless, disenfranchised and otherwise fucked over by society. Most don't exactly cooperate, but when they don't, they tend to get murdered as sacrifices for further rituals for devil summoning. So while the party is investigating who, exactly, is responsible for following them, 
This group of thugs is engaging in what can only be called devil worshipping and some hardly fucked up shit for the purposes of summoning more and more infernals. With the ultimate goal of summoning an archdemon, Rita is basically hell on earth. So, when the party finally manages to find a few of the gang members, they're possessed and jacked as shit. And here, ultimately, is where the story takes a turn from investigation to superheroics. The party goes back home and regroups when the whole gangsters have turned to legitimate devil worshipping and might be about to murder thousands of people to summon basically Lucifer. Bomb has been dropped. They unanimously agree that this cannot be allowed to happen. Not because it would bother them, but because it's the right thing to do. The party sits up, basically starts prepping for war. From what little the party knows about spirits, they deducted these particular infernos didn't normally need a circle or anything particular if they were weak. But the more and more powerful infernos required more and more problematic processes to summon. Thing was though, was that the gang had recently moved shop to the old quarter of the city. And due to how the plumbing was arranged in this portion of the city, basically had about three-fourths of a circle required to summon an archdemon already done. They, the devil worshippers, had also been going on so-called charity runs and had been intelligent enough to use slash line their vehicle tyres with blades that would scrape what was left of the circle into the pavement as they drove by. Furthermore, while the entire circle was useful, it wasn't exactly required. The entire circle would mean that the archdemon would instantly be at full strength while having a marred circle would leave him at less and less power, depending on how damaged the circle was. The bigger problem was, however, the fact that Mardi Gras was approaching, and the party was almost completely certain that the devil worshippers were planning on commencing in a bloodbath to end all bloodbaths on that day, to effectively jumpstart slash feed the summoning process. So the party did the logical thing. They called in a shit ton of bomb threats all over the city before getting headed out, burning their house to the ground as they did so, so nothing arcane could be plucked from them in case something went horrifyingly wrong. A bit foolhardy, honestly. But they were paladining the fuck out, and I wasn't going to stop such a beautiful thing from happening. Of course, when I brought up that Paradox was still going to be a bitch to deal with, it turned out that they had come up with an awesome, if horrifying, way around that. Basically, a mage can split a part of their soul off and centre it on an object to create a field where magic can almost never create paradox. In this case, they had drawn lots, and when Alan drew a short stick, Beverly said fuck that noise and did it to herself. This weakened her capacity to cast magic and would prove problematic for her son. So the party goes out, basically finds the gang and goes into hiding to see what the hell is going on now that the gang doesn't have as many people to murder. The gang sends the homeless majority further ahead from the more heavily armed gang members. I pause and look at the players. I mention how some of the gang seem to be raising their guns. I pause again. I mention how the gang is now aiming at the homeless majority. I pause again and look at the players. It's only as I open my mouth to say more that Beverly and Danny's players' eyes widen with realisation. And then, of course, the gang opens fire on the homeless people. The party had gotten it right, calculating that the Mardi Gras festivities would be the way the gang would get enough people to fuel the summoning. They hadn't, however, accounted for the metric shit ton of basically enslaved homeless people the gang had been collecting as well. In this case, a fatal miscalculation. The party had failed, an archdemon summoning had occurred. By all rights, the party ought to be dead by now. They're effectively at ground zero, and some of the few people who aren't corrupted to hell and back, and such, stand out like a beacon in the darkness. But then Alan's player says something that makes me continue the game. We can fix this. The characters understand that this is basically the end, and as such, go forward with reckless abandon. Beverly dies in a hail of abnormally lucky gunfire in the first couple of rounds. Her soul stone, however, is still intact. And as such, the party's odds of paradoxing are really low. Michelle and Danny pull their power together and effectively ice the entire street, killing most of the gunmen and lower tier possessed. However, Danny's unnatural luck for not paradoxing has run out. And he paradoxes so badly that by the time he finishes rolling dice, he's gone from full health to being unmade from existence. He didn't just die from paradox, but actually managed to take more than double his health and lethal damage from the paradox. For those not in the know of mage, Paradox normally deals bashing damage. If you take enough bashing damage, it becomes lethal damage. 
This poor bastard managed to roll enough critical successes on his own paradox roll to straight up be removed from existence and basically put in a timeout corner. Michelle, however, was the one the gods had given Danny's unnatural luck to as she came out of the spell unmarred. She continued her reign of terror by basically murdering all but two of the gang members and the arch demon itself, Q. Allen, who, as a life mage, just shoots the other two with a pistol. Nothing it would seem too memorable except the fact that Alan still had all of his magical juice. Then Michelle tried to go into melee with the Archdemon. This, it turns out, was a mistake. Particularly without much magic to back yourself up with, she managed to stab it in the demon equivalent of the eye, but then got sliced in half for her trouble almost unceremoniously. That said, the party had done damned well. Basically everything but the Archdemon is dead, and while it was unlikely that it could be stopped, they put up a damn good fight. And then Alan went, for all intents purposes, Super Saiyan. So, something I hadn't been aware of. While Alan was indeed an Archmage of Life, he was also a goddamn unarmed master. So when I tell him, basically, that this is probably it, he turns to me and says, My character accelerates his own bodily processes and activates 100% of his strength via magical blood dropping and removal of unconscious limiters. I blinked a couple of times because I didn't know shit about biology or anatomy. But it turns out that people don't use most of their own muscular strength when doing stuff. Because the amount of power people have is enough to rip tendons and shit off bones with said power. However, he had gotten around to that by accelerating his own healing processes to the umpteenth degree. And he had maxed out his character strength. So, right as the demon starts monologuing about how useless it all is, and how Alan had better give up on other big bad evil guy shit. Alan drop kicks him through a brick building and smashes the demon's face with a fucking vending machine. It wasn't much, but it hurt the demon a bit. He got back up, only to be met with a barrage of punches and kicks that started making glass across the street shatter at the sheer noise of the impact. The demon is still kicking ass mind, and manages to cleave Alan and twain. Which didn't really matter because Alan straight up fused his two halves back together using magic trickery. Of course, then Alan reaches at the demon's face, grabs the knife embedded there, and wrenches it to the side as he fish hooks the demon's jaw in the opposite direction. It doesn't kill the demon, but it does, I say, stun him for one round. Then Alan's player tells me that he wants to pull every last bit of magical and muscular strength into one last attack. In this case, a simple kick upwards. Alan's character has been running out of time since cells can only divide so many times after all. He punted the damn thing to outer space. This is not an exaggeration. He, by literally pulling everything from what I rolled to be 20 strength and god knows how much magic, he managed to kick the thing so hard that after rolling about half the dice necessary to account for everything and getting a crit success on about 10 of them, it was leaving orbit and absolutely fucked the street and most of the surrounding houses. But due to the party basically calling in enough bomb threats to scare a small nation, nobody was dead. Except Alan. He had artificially aged about 60 years in about three rounds of combat, and his entire leg had just snapped off with that final strike. The party was well and truly dead. We all shook on it afterwards. While they were a bit sad to see every one of the characters go, they agreed that it had ended about as awesomely as could be reasoned and seemed to enjoy it. While Alan wasn't technically dead when we concluded, we all know that he was going through body-wide cell death for certain. That said, the players looked at me and all agreed that despite the death, it had been worth it. So what I love about, like, particularly, like, you know, all, like, you know, think of, like, all Garrison Party, all Skeleton Party, all Wizard Party. There's so much utility within Wizards that it really isn't like a mono group at all because there's so different like disciplines of magic. Yeah. You know, there's so there's so much utility in Wizards. There's so much you can do with them. Yeah, yeah. you can yeah. go and you you know, like, you know, a lot of people go for the more generic, like, oh, we got an ice wizard, we got a fucking fire wizard, you know, like an evoker style mage. But with this, like, you know, you can turn off a lot and I love the idea of maybe like a a fisty wizard would be a good word for that. Uh, WWE look wizard, <laughs> <laughs> you know, fucking Brock Lesnar or some shit. Stuff. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's there's a lot, you can there's a lot to work with there. So like, if you guys have any particular like, wizard stories that you've ever played, or let us know one that you've done yourself. Let us know in the comments down below, and we'll see you in the next video. Bye.